This is Restless reacting to John Piper, the new Calvinists, and the new community. Michael, we just got finished recording our episode going through John Piper's features of Calvinism. You Making just everyone fi- that listens mad. You just finished lambasting Christ-centered preaching uh, like a boss. You put, it, you put it in such a horrible <laughs> negative light. It was gold. Hallelujah, my friend. No doubt. I... I think that the the biggest issue our this last episode we just record has is that because Piper covers so many subjects, I think it's going to be hard for that episode to hang together. Because as we just as we were about to say, like I think each one of those could have its own episode and needs to be fleshed out. It is. It's hard. You, there's so many different ways we could go, and it probably turned out way too long. And it's just uh, it is difficult to know which direction to take it. Yeah. Yeah, let me just make one comment on your your comment on the gospel-centered stuff, only because I didn't uh, in the episode. Then we'll we can jump into to, to, to Piper's this the totality of the talk because I think the whole talk is very interesting. And if if you thought this, if you listen to the lecture and you come and you listen to this and you thought, oh yeah, that's just a whole lecture on the new Calvinists and what they should do, it is not like that. It is. It's a little strange because it's known as the talk where Piper explains what new Calvinism is. And he does that for about 10 minutes in a one hour talk, right? Right. But yeah, on this topic of this, this Christ-centered preaching or gospel-centered books or, you know, whatever, I think the problem becomes it, if I want to say this, is you are right. Jesus said all the prophets, all the writings, they're about me. Amen. What? What saves you is Christ, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That is what saves me, right? Yep. That is glorious, right? Michael is an ordained minister, and he has said, whatever worldly pursuits I could have, I am going to pursue proclaiming that, right? right. So so not, not denigrating that at all. But with this understanding, I think we sort of flatten all of Scripture. That's scripture right. says in every single passage, the same thing over and over again, right. which is a little bit what we actually get in this Piper sermon. This Piper sermon is actually a lot about justification, and he's talking through uh, Richard Gaffin's book. I'm sure a wonderful book, Richard Gaffin. Uh, if you'd love to come, on, if you'd like to come on the show, love to have you. Uh, it'd be great. And his defense of justification against N.T. Wright. And and here is what is really interesting about this talk. Piper basically says new Calvinism has shown us that justification and tulip can hold us together in Christian unity. Do you, do you agree with my essential assessment of what he's saying? Yeah. Everything is again, limited down to these kind of core doctrines. Really, you could say it's all limited around justification. Uh, And if we hold to that center then everything else will kind of follow. And what you find, especially you know, now that uh, things have kind of spiraled out with that movement, uh, is that that's actually not enough. That's not enough to hold you together. Not because it doesn't, uh, like in, in the, the sense of does the, the justification that we receive because of Christ's death hold us together in like unity as the invisible church? Like, of course, like that, absolutely, that's, you know, uh, that is a a central element of our unity that we are all, uh, all of our sin was imputed to Christ, all of his righteousness was imputed to each of us. We have one Lord, one Savior. Exactly. Uh, So like that is central, obviously. Uh, It's it's important. Uh, But if that was everything, God could have written a much smaller book. And and this, this is the point you were trying to make in the show. Of course, justification does have implications on unity, right? God is no respecter of persons. All people require the same justification, no matter anything about you, right? Right. And God, in Calvinism, we say he disperses that blessing unprovoked by anything about you, right? That is a leveling, that is a unifying thing. But that is not the only way the scripture calls us to unity. Yes. Right. And so even this, even this point where he's he's trying to refute 
the new perspective on Paul, which we are not going to go into now. He, he does not, he doesn't go past. He's like, yeah, justification isn't just about who is allowed in covenant and how that looks. It is about our salvation, but then we don't, but again, there are other ways we look at these things, which I, I just think you see in this talk. And and I think what is fascinating, this is the thing I realized about this talk as I listened to it is, so Piper has kind of always talked a lot about race. Michael, we can let our hair down. We're in bonus content land, by the way. I poured a glass of wine. We're, we're having a good time here. Piper has always talked a lot about race, right? And, yeah. and, I, and I don't fault him for that. He's an American pastor. And that is a huge, especially now more than ever, that is a huge part of American life. So I don't, I am unsurprised that, He wants to discuss that. However, this is what I think is so fascinating. I think part of the move in this lecture is he lists, and as we heard, he makes, he tells you how big a deal, all, how broad Reformed theology is, right? He, you know, it's, it's from J.I. Packer to John Knox, right? He gives, he gives this big, you know, very, very emotive, very good, like introduction to how big a tent Reformed theology is. And I think what he does is the move he then makes and he says, and now the big tent is multiculturalism. It is the diversity that you essentially find valued in American society now. Yeah, which in itself, and this is not maybe an area that I know a ton about, but uh, you have a lot of newer research today because you know, racial animosity and, and issues of race are such prominent ideas. You have a lot of work right now going back and showing uh, that like uh, reformed theology and uh, those different, you know, kind of denominational groups that uh, may make up the kind of a reformed world have for a long time been very, uh, diverse in this way, right? That it's this is not so even you know I mean even uh, Piper tracing things back to Augustine, uh, but even in America that there has been a a diversity within the movement. If that's the kind of diversity that you want to focus in on and talk about, um, you can tell me if you know this. I I really don't know. I I have John Piper's book Bloodlines, and I I've read parts of it. But if I remember right, I mean, one, he, I mean, he grew up in the South uh, where it just seems like there, you know, uh, tend to be uh, more animosities or at least, you know, maybe that's just a Northern stereotype and I'm just speaking from my, uh, you know, Northern privilege, but, uh, but it seems like there's, you know, maybe more, uh, more felt guilt for past sins. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, if minor say is right, didn't, John Piper and his family have uh, like a, an African American servant at one point, or or something like that. I remember reading from him that they had maybe a nanny or something like that, and he seemed kind of tore up about it. Yeah, I I have not read Bloodlines either, but I did watch the book trailer, and where he indicates a a fraught, like a it, it appears he does not feel he was guilt free in the Jim Crow South, right? He wasn't just, he wasn't there that at least in some way he participated in, in what might be viewed as racism. And he's growing up in that era. So he's, you know, I mean, he is, he is involved during that time. And you can imagine, even if you were not personally like a part of all of these things, and even if you were like a kid growing up in that, you can imagine having uh, that kind of, of guilt weigh on your conscience when you think about those things. That makes sense. And, and so let me, I want to say about this talk on race if you're a person who's now tuning in and going, oh man, they're they're just about to they're about to tell me how woke this was in 2014. No, I'm not. If you are sick of how we're you're listening to evangelicals and even new Calvinists talk about race, you will be refreshed by this. Right. I wrote down some of the quotes. He talks about the essential doctrine of the ethnic diversity of hell. Right? Which again, is is great because that he's saying ethnic diversity in and of itself is not a good. How do I know? That is that is not center. How do I know? Because hell is ethnically diverse, right? Mm. He says, um, he says that I think you just got this podcast uh, 
I kicked know. off of any kind of platform just by repeating what what Piper said. I'm back quoting then. John Piper, everybody. Right. I know he could never give this sermon anymore, right? He talks about el- uh, election, as we've already mentioned, eliminating any distinction among person because there's nothing, yeah. nothing I do or bring. He talks about the unrepentance of the KKK Klansman and the Louis Farrakhan follower that he's, you could never see true repentance in either of those groups. Again, I think a lot of this is, is pretty refreshing because again, I do think he's saying we're going to find unity and justification. We're going to find unity in our guilt before God. We're going to find unity in the fact that there's nothing anyone can possibly do to merit or demerit God's favor because it's God's favor. But I think you see, I think you see the seeds of the, I don't know what the right word to call it, is race, racial confusion, not, not knowing at all how to in, interact anymore. I think you see potentially where it stems from. One, I do think when we say the reform theology, the big tent, the, the unity of the church that justification brought, right? Why does, why does Paul confront Peter to his face over justification over who he's eating with? He's eliminating racism in the church. I think you see the beginning of where we are now because we've said Christian unity is what the modern understanding of ethnic and racial multiculturalism. Yeah, even even the fact that you have this going back and applying modern categories of race to what's going on in the Jew Gentile controversy in the early church is is extremely uh, uh, problematic. Right. Like that is that is not going to be how Peter and Paul were thinking of these things. Now, it might have overlap. I'm not saying that there's like it's 100 percent different in every way. Uh, You might have some, you know, kind of ideas of kind of a clean, unclean element to the kind of modern racialized way of thinking. But uh, to to just apply that as if obviously when you read about these things in Scripture, the issue was race. Obviously, this is what it's talking about. So, so tell us, tell us why the taking our conception of grace, reading it into the Galatian controversy, reading it into the uh, book of Acts, where this is kind of central, even, even, you know, all these things, this, this is, if you know what the new perspective on Paul is, this is all related to that, this, who's in, who do we have fellowship with? Why is, why is, as I'm sure everyone listening has heard a pastor do, relate relating this to our understanding of race what's what's the problem with that so one of the reasons that this is is problematic is you're dealing with uh the the difference between the old and new covenant right and uh when like this is a much bigger issue than you have a different nationality than me or something like that Uh, it's again it's not that that's not a part of it because it obviously was a part of it because you're you're dealing with uh kind of a you know national israel in a sense uh the 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 visible people of god being national israel and uh, especially related to uh the the ceremonies of the old covenant uh, that they participate in Uh, but even there you see throughout the old testament that you can you can bring others into that Right. I mean, that's that's not something that is is purely exclusionary on the basis of ethnicity or anything like that. Some of the major players and stories in the history of redemption in the Old Testament happen to be be people who were outside of that nationality, outside of that covenant, and then were brought in. And that is part of the the typology that is looking forward to the day when the whole of the Gentiles will be uh, brought into the the uh, visible people of God. But uh, but then to uh, you know assume that that distinction is is the same as a you know a modern uh, conception of race, it's just not going to fit because what they're dealing with is here are people that God Himself has designated as those who make up the visible church. Right, like God Himself has designated this, and has designated certain ceremonies that go along with being a part of these people. And then, like this is this is something that He was, you know, uh, He He used in order to teach the people, prepare them until the day that the Messiah would come, and and uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, bring about the fulfillment of these things. Uh, but 
this is, it's, it's not as though uh, God at any point said uh, only those who are uh, ethnically, like they have this bloodline, this uh, particular uh, family heritage are going to be allowed into this, right? It, it had much more to do uh, with these covenantal structures. And uh, now you have with the coming of Christ, with the new covenant, uh, an opening up of these things, something that was, again, it was, it was portrayed, it was, it was talked about uh, throughout the Old Testament. It was prophesied that this was going to happen, and now it is happening. And what you're, what you're facing, especially in the book of Acts, is this, this uh, kind of hostility between uh, this, you know, kind of new forming community. Uh, you could say that, you know, the, yep. the new community, is, as uh, Piper yep. uses it, about new Calvinism. Yep. Yeah, I think that right. I think again, it's fine as Michael has said. We're we are we are because we're doing fully cancelable things here. We are laboring to be fair. There is a secondary application. If God has eliminated the distinction in his covenant people between the new, the old covenant people and those who are outside of that, how much more should any man made distinction? Right? How much those yep. things should not function, right. right? But yeah. But again, right, the thing, right, that they discover in Acts is, right, it, it is a justification issue. It says, wow, if what we've learned is that they must be saved by faith, then so must we, right? They, they go out to the world to preach the gospel. They learn all God is requiring of these people is faith in Jesus. Oh, wow, that's all that's required of us because he's made the new man. He's made the new community. I want to ask two related points to this that I think might... I think might start laying down the cards of a person saying, I think I know how we got to this, this weird place we are now. So then, right. He talks about the other, one of the big things that hold us together is, and I'm sorry, we're not playing clips. This is an hour long thing. And we are just, we're working our way through it much quicker than that. He talks about the glory of God in the, and you, and you can hear Piper doing this of, of the, the, the worshipers in every, in everything and you know jesus is finding worshipers everywhere and every tongue and every tribe and this is good this is good this is what revelation said well th that is something uh jesus is doing and that is a heavenly reality i wonder what happens when we read that back into what's supposed to happen in the new calvinism or in your church do, do you understand what i'm saying pastor michael Explain a little bit more. I also will admit that my mind was going on its own little yeah. uh, run. And so uh, I have something that came to mind when you, uh, about this. But here's when you start saying in heaven, God will be praised by every tribe, tongue and nation. Even yeah. even the idea that we have the same understanding of that might be errant, as you've already pointed out. When we say that is something Jesus is doing, that is what is going to bring God the maximal glory, as as John Piper likes to state things. Well, what should New Calvinism be? What should your local church be? Well, it should look a lot like that, right? So you're you're over realizing the eschaton, right? You are you are trying to bring what is going to where what it's going to be like at the end. You're trying to bring that into the local uh, and the temporal right now, and. And you're saying it's some, it's something we need to drum up. Yeah. No. And so what, if you think that's the maximally glorifying thing to God, if you need to drum this up, what happens when justification or the, the doctrines of grace aren't unifying as much? Well, we better, we better do whatever it takes to, to hit the diversity goals worldwide in our church in our movement we better promote whatever voices we need to to make this thing as maximally glorifying as we can you also see how this easily becomes a, a division even though you're trying to unify everything this becomes a division between uh, those who are in major metropolitan areas and those who are in rural areas yeah. right all of a sudden you can't be the fullness of the church if you are right. outside of the city where you have populations from all over the world coming together. Now you actually can't be a full church in every way unless you do hit these different marks on, right. on the kind of multicultural checklist. It will, will Michael's church ever be 
maximally glorious because it doesn't have uh as since we're in bonus content land as as the gospel coalition published an article on the 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 need you have for a multicultural christmas no it's (laughs) this you you just all i'm saying is i don't think again i don't think piper six years ago imagines out where we are now right but you see the seeds that we need to find ways to unify we need and we and we we know the the irreducible things we can't let go of but if you know we've got to do whatever else we can and so i'm also this becomes uh this becomes the one of the major markers of of the church when you don't have as we talked about in the video or the video when we were walking through the the different parts of the video uh, when you don't have uh, a set ecclesiology right when you don't have well here's what marks out a true church it's the word which was mentioned but then there's kind of missing the sacraments it's kind of missing the idea of discipline and how that works and and the structure of the church when you don't have that well you need you know you're going to fill it in with something else right when you leave things so open it's going to be filled in inevitably and so what ends up filling this in well one of the things that fills it in is this idea of kind of uh, multiculturalism as like the goal of every church as a mark of a true church right now hey if you have a church in your neighborhood is made up of just tons of different uh, ethnicities and cultures and uh, you're saying hey i want to be able to reach all these people with the gospel and so it makes sense that your church might look like people from all kinds of different places yeah hey like that's great praise god right i mean that's yeah. You'll That's have awesome. better potlucks than Michael's church. That's oh, for that sure. sounds great. <laughs> yeah, but that sounds awesome. Yeah, no, totally. This again, this is like it's it's a it is it's actually ironically not a reflection of the actual diversity the church has everywhere. It's mm-hmm. it's a belief that you know diversity is something that happens in a community. Actually, the church is way, 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 way more diverse, and we could never all get together and agree, and we could never language-wise um, cross these lines. And Our- if uh, if your focus is on, you know, the local church, or if you are, you know, part of this kind of loose network of these basically non-denominational or evangelical churches that are that are just, you know, barely connected. Uh, you have to have the diversity shown in your local church, right? Yep. If, if you are not connected to the broader church and you're saying, well, you know, like we want the visible church to be uh, yes. very clearly diverse. Well, then church. that has to be oh, man. in your yes. local church, as yeah. opposed to saying, hey, this like our church is worldwide, right? Like we have, we have connections all over the place. We're incredibly diverse in, in that sense. We have formal church unity. And this is, Again, this is my promo for Presbyterian for Presbyterian for people. We have formal church unity with churches everywhere in the world, and and he, and so our our church actually does reflect it. Sorry, we we just don't we just don't have church autonomy like you think is important. But but here's the deal: if you're like, but Matt, are you are you really okay? you're okay with these monocultural churches or whatever negative words we've come up with that? 25 years ago people would have just looked at you sideways for saying these these horrible like ways that we found to like slander people so yeah. that we can be unified right so, so that so that we can gather together and not exclude people matt don't you don't you want to worship with saints who are different than you from all over the world and all these things my my answer to you is yes that's why i want to go to heaven you- now, Matt, you sound like a, a racist that is saying that you would never worship with Let's- people who are of a different culture and and uh, ethnicity than you. Yep. That's an inside joke for some of our listeners, but I, <laughs> I, I can't wait. I don't know where this will release in our podcast listening. It's great to know as far as it's taken, we've now had one of us called racist on the podcast. So good to it, know. Let's just we- get it out of the way. If, if we just we- do it to ourselves, it won't hurt when it comes from others, right. right? We've made it. No, of course not. But what I'm saying is, and here's and here's what I think maybe the solution is. Again, you the you watch you watch the apostles go out, watch them right interact, watch how Paul again, whatever cultural good, whatever any of these things that 
matter. What Michael and I are saying is that they aren't irrelevant. They aren't, um, it isn't, again, John Piper, I'm, a, I'm just agreeing with John Piper, hell is ethnically diverse. So that just ethnic diversity alone isn't inherently a good. It, it, it is good. It will be in heaven. There will be a heavenly version of it. And there are times we see it in the church. And, and, it, and we don't just have diversity with people who don't look like us. We have diversity with people who don't think like us, speak our language. We have diversity over all of history because the church triumphant worships with us in heaven. That's right. And all of those people are way, way more different than us than anyone of any skin color in a Western country. Right. And guess what? We worship with people because we are part of the Catholic church who worship in non-Western countries, who worship in fields. And that is a blessing. Yeah. But what I want to ask, Michael, is this John Piper ends, right? It's this force on the glory of God. So Piper, way to go, man. And this is not what Piper would say, because as you've said, Piper is Piper is up in the ivory tower. You and I are down on the ground. Michael, and, and, and even with the, what is the one Westminster question everyone knows who couldn't tell you what the word catechism means? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever, right? That's right. True. Here's my question to you, Michael. Can God's glory be added to at all? I'm not trying to trap you. I don't think I am. <laughs> I guess I feel like you're trapping me. Ultimately, what you would say is, is no. Like God is no. uh, eternally glorious. He is uh, maximally glorious. There's no like, uh, when we glorify God, what is happening is we are being brought into glorifying God. This is not like, uh, you don't want to start saying, well, God wasn't glorious till he created humanity, right? right? Until he created creation and he needed creation in order to be glorified. That is, that is going farther than what the catechism said, what, what the confession says, right? And right. what the Bible points to in that man was created to glorify God. It is not as though man is necessary for the glory of God. We, this is the point I think might be important. And again, this is some deep theology, but I think at some point, especially in the not ivory tower Calvinists, it comes out of our fingertips. You can't add to God's glory. You can't, you by trying to talk to people different than you, by believing the right thing, by doing any of this, you can't add to God's glory. God doesn't need us to do any of these things. Now, we are, right, the, the, the catechism is getting at the purpose of man on earth, that the purpose of man is ultimately God were directed, right? God created to share his glory, to reflect his glory, but not add to it, not out of need. And I think that, ironically, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this before we end, some of the some of this Calvinist rhetoric, some of this this um, talk about the the nations for God's glory, multicultural, the every ethnicity for God's glory, uh, you know, publishing a million books a second for God's glory, which is a, a handy way to also uh, monetarily uh, <laughs> recoup authors, is. I think on the ground level, not at the John Piper guy level, on the ground level, becomes a a very non-Calvinist doctrine. A very, I've got to do this to for God to give God glory, kind of doctrine. That's fascinating because uh, one of the things that uh, I've told people when when we're talking about uh, like what is what is the best thing you could be doing right now in the church is uh, and what is the best thing you can do to, you know, I, I've had people ask me uh, with all of those people who've been reading like these gospel centered books and, and, and all of this stuff uh, they, you know, they've, they've been attuned to the gospel coalition and to, you know, they were kind of introduced to these things through new Calvinism and, and they've been a part of that, but they are still clearly burdened under, the idea that they have not like done enough 
or like like there, there is this sense of of like they have not accomplished what they're supposed to accomplish for God. And uh, this is why I'm often telling people like the, the best possible thing you can do right now is to just preach the complete and absolute free grace of God that is in the gospel. And I think that's the antidote to some of the stuff that we're talking about. And that might sound strange because you're like, how can you say that the antidote to uh, the problems of like gospel centeredness, whatever that was, is to preach the gospel and, and the free grace of God. And I think what you're getting at is something that I've never, never completely tied, uh, tied together. But I think this is why, because there's so many people that are basically living in a kind of works righteousness and it's, I have to do these things. I have to make my church look like this. I have to like take part in, in these conferences. If I don't get to this big name level, if, if I don't do any of these things or, you know, like God spoke to me and he told me to do this thing and, you know, I have to do it. Otherwise what, like God is wrong and God's not going to be glorified. And in other words, you are uh, heaping up burdens upon people, maybe unintentionally, but you are heaping up burdens upon people that they can never fulfill, right? To, to glorify God, you know, like, like uh, he needs you to glorify him maximally in your life, right? We would say, hey, you were made to glorify him, uh, just like those who uh, are vessels of wrath are made to glorify him. Uh, but this is not a, you have to, you know, work this hard in order to glorify God more. You have to like, add to this in some way. Uh, I think what you're saying is kind of tying things together in my mind that I've never quite placed because I've always wondered why do I meet so many people that just seem like, like they are so uh, centered on their works and specifically when we're talking about justification, but all they read is gospel centered, cross centered, you know, uh, crossway and gospel coalition books. And yet they come away from that and everything is a kind of works righteousness to them. Why is this? Why don't, like, why can't they, they see this? And I think what you just pointed out is, is what I think that is. I'm rambling and it's, I shouldn't it, keep running. It's Luther in his famous statement that in the freedom of the Christian, that God does not need your good works. Your neighbor does, right? Mm -hmm. In, in first Chronicles, I just looked up this verse because it just reminded me of this. Ascribe to the Lord Yahweh the glory due to his name and bring an offering before him, right? You cannot add to the being of glory of his being, right? That is internal. That is inherent. That is unchanging. We can ascribe that glory to him. He possesses it. There's no change there. And we can do so for the sake of the world, right? We can do so for the sake of, for others, but we can't add or subtract to it. And so I just thought that while I don't think that's Piper's point, I think when you, you begin to talk about all the ways in new Calvinism, in diversity, we're going to glorify God, you can quickly, um, run down this this slope so i know we're probably going along i probably got it uh yep i don't know if you have to cut some stuff or and i know i was randomly just there but i do want to say one more thing that's just Please been do. on my mind and probably why i've been a little bit distracted because i've just been thinking about this here's a little rant for you on the problems of trying to take our modern conceptions of of race and racial harmony and and racial Finally, we're getting it and applying it to uh, the, the scripture. And I see this all the time and it drives me nuts. Uh, Acts chapter six is when you have these, these deacons chosen uh, from among the people uh, in order to serve so that the apostles can keep preaching the gospel. It's, they, they don't want to uh, help with the distribution of food. They think it's far more important than that you know, kind of social act. Uh, they think it's far more important that they be preaching the gospel and devoting themselves to prayer. But what they do is they say, well, uh, I should back up and give the context, right? The context is that you have Hellenistic widows, which are, which are uh, uh, Jewish Greek speakers, uh, widows who are being missed in the distribution of food by the Christians. And so there's this kind of animosity and, and dispute that arises between the Hellenistic 
uh, widows and the Hebrews. And so uh, what happens is uh, the apostles come and they say, well, we're not going to wait on tables. We're not going to, uh, to do this, but you should choose people from among yourself to, to deal with this problem. So uh, this is in Acts chapter six, beginning verse one. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Par Parmenas, and Nicholas, a uh, proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So here we have this, you know, kind of uh, forming of kind of like often thought of as the first deacons, those who are going to deal with kind of the physical needs of the people. And so many times what I hear about this passage is the fact that you're dealing with, with these uh, Hellenists who are upset, so Greek speakers, and then the people that they choose that are chosen from amongst the disciples are all the names are Greek names, except potentially one, right? They're, they're mostly Greek names. And so therefore... What we have here is people choosing uh, based upon wanting to like pick people that represent kind of the ethnic diversity that is true in the church. And so the leaders are reflecting the ethnic diversity of the people. Now, I'm not denying that uh, the, the people chose from among themselves. That did happen. But what do the apostles say are the qualifications for these men? It has nothing to do with whether they were Hellenists or Hebrews. It has nothing to do with that. It doesn't say anything like that. What does it say, right? Appoint for yourself seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. They have to be full of the spirit and of good repute. It has nothing to do with that. And every time I've heard this preached in the last, I don't know, five years or more, every single time, this fact that their names are mostly Greek names is used to say, therefore, we need this kind of, you know, uh, multi-ethnic diversity amongst our pastorate, which again, hey, if you're choosing leaders from among yourselves and you are, you know, ethnically and culturally diverse, well, that'll probably happen. But even that still, even if you're in that situation, the reason that you're choosing people has nothing to do with that. That is not the, the reasons that are given. The reasons that are given is that they're full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Wow, we asked for 20 reviews, you guys gave us 20 reviews. So we gave you the full Piper reaction. And by the way, when we hit 25 reviews, we're doing another Driscoll reaction. Thanks everybody. Share and rate and review this show. It just drives me crazy and I wanted to rant about it. And you can put this wherever you want or cut it and do what you will with it. Great. I will. I will use it. I've been trying to gin that up out of you uh <laughs> so 